fell The uncertainty, the uncertainty That all of this will end No, let's sing. I search the world.
Dance party going. Cry out to worship. Who 
stars to shine Perhaps creation longs to have the words to say But this joy is mine With a thousand give it my all on that song because Jesus you are so worth a thousand hallelujahs and a thousand more Lord I, I pray that we will never forget the thought that you will leave the 99 
and come for us, come for one. Lord, I know that there's people here tonight that are going through something. I know that there are people here tonight that are going through really, really, really hard things. But Lord, as we sit here tonight, I pray that you will unite us as a family and as a community in this town, in Bismarck. Lord, as I sit here up on this stage, as I stand here, Lord, I see all these people and all these souls praising and worshiping you. And Lord, it's enough. It's just enough. It's enough to be here. It's enough to be in your presence. Thank you for the gift that you give back to us when we worship you, Lord, because it's so sweet and it's so tender. Do for these people tonight what they can't do for themselves. I say that all the time. Because you're a God that understands. You're a God that fulfills. You're a God that never breaks his promises, Lord. We thank you that you turn those graves into gardens and the seas into highways. Do that for us tonight. You're the great mender and the great defender. In your name, all God's children said, amen. You may be seated. Okay. Well, thanks for being here, everybody. My name is Tim Pesky. I'm the ministry coordinator here. Uh, I'm just going to go through a couple of announcements real quick as we're kind of getting started here. Uh, the ski trip is January 13th through the 16th. That's like a family ski trip. So high schoolers, junior hires, everybody sign up with your parents. Um, it's going to be a, be a great time. It sounds like it's going to be really cold. It's, it's going to be cold, but it, it's going to be, it's going to be good. Uh, we're going to have a ski meeting, though, to help, um, uh, to help you reserve rooms and tickets December 6th after the service, so after next service on Wednesday, and uh, December 10th after that service, too, so we can help you. Actually, you'll get your tickets. You can sign up for tickets there, uh, rent your hotel rooms. It's going, to be a, it's going to be a nice, quick meeting. Sounds kind of expensive. Thanks, Ty, for your help tonight. Um, we've got a new member class, actually. We're pretty excited about that new member class, Wednesday, December 13th. So next week, we don't actually, we have a service next week, and then we're done for the year. And then on December 13th, there's going to be a new member class. So if you're thinking, hey, this is my kind of place. I want to be here. I want to be a member. Uh, December 13th, 6 to 7.30 is the new member class. Please sign up for that on our website. Sounds like i got to sit through a long meeting again. Thanks, Ty. Uh, launch. Launch is a really cool thing. If you are a senior, a senior, not a senior hire, but a senior, you're going to graduate this year, we hope, if Carson can pass his classes. Um, we want you to go to launch, which is for seniors and their parents. That's January 3rd, so that's the week before Ignite starts up again. January 3rd, 5.30 to 8, there's going to be food. There's going to be people talking about, hey, maybe you're going to go to college. Maybe you're going to do a job. Maybe maybe uh, you just got to know how am I going to parent uh, my kids through this transition time. Um, it's going to be a great time, um, and we really encourage you to sign up for that as well. I wish I would have had that when I was a senior in high school. <laughs> yep, I do too, Ty. <laughs> I do too. Uh, please sign up for Christmas services. Christmas, you can't be mad about Christmas, Ty. Christmas Eve, 12 two and four sign up never make that face again sign up on our website uh follow the instructions you don't have to sign like every person up in your family you just got to get reservation tickets for everybody so we know we've got enough people in the room and i'm sure you've got something yeah i bet the service i want to be at is already full <laughs> you even made the trombone player sad on that one man <laughs> Are you okay? You seem a little, you like, I'm happy about these announcements. This is exciting things happening. And then your perspective is, I wanted a trumpet for this bit. <laughs> Follow that one up, Randy. If you're a visitor here tonight, and I know we have them, I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, you know what? Before we get started with the word, why don't you all stand up and say hi to each other and make an effort to say hi to somebody you don't recognize, okay? Go across the room a little bit. Say hi.
<laughs> oh, boy. What is the kingdom of God? The single most important thing Jesus talked about. The focus of all that he did, taught, the epicenter of all of his miracles. All about the kingdom of God. And Jesus would say things like, the kingdom of God is near you. The kingdom of God is hidden within you. The kingdom of God has drawn near. And, and you're like, what, do you, what does he mean by that? And what he means is, is that God's world, the world that he's reclaiming and making new, right now overlaps with the messed up world that we see. And so we see incredible good and incredible evil all at the same time. Jesus would call it in a parable, wheat and weeds. To get us started, um, I want to ask you a question. Turn and just discuss with each other real quick. What is one thing that you see in the world that makes you believe in God? Something that you've seen that made you go, there's got to be a God. Okay, go ahead, discuss. 15, 20 seconds. Okay, stop. Stop. Let me get one answer from over in this section. Just yell it out. What was it? What? Nature. I can't hear you. Nature. nature. Can you be more specific? There's a lot of nature out there. That's not very specific either. Good try, though. But yes. How about over here? Birds. Birds? Interesting. Bumblebee. Why a bumblebee? Because it's not supposed to be able to fly, and yet it can. Okay. Leave it to Ernie for that one. Good, good thought. How about over here? Yeah, be quiet now. Over here. Wildflowers. Especially a big field of them, right? How about over here? What did you say? Archaeological, archaeological evidence. Gotcha. Just helping you out there. And there's a lot of that, you know that? There's a ton of it. Interesting, isn't it? That um, apart from the very, very uh, lucid contribution over there about the archaeological evidence, everybody else pointed to some sort of beautiful thing in nature. Something that either just defies explanation or is so beautiful, and yet... What was easy for you to see is actually really hard for a lot of other people to see. We can see the same things and come to absolutely opposite conclusions about where they came from. For example, Stephen Hawking, the late Stephen Hawking, often considered one of the smartest people in history, or at least the 20th century, said, I believe the simplest explanation is there is no God. No one created our universe and no one directs our fate. This leads me to a profound realization. There is probably no heaven and no afterlife either. Wow. You see a bumblebee. You see wildflowers. You see nature and you're like, got to be a God. And I think many of us in this room have been in that place, haven't we? He sees no creator. He sees accident. He sees just random chance. Makes me wonder who's the smart one. I think at least Abraham Lincoln was honest about it when he said the following. He said, I can see how it might be possible for a man to look down upon the earth 
and be an atheist. In other words, if he looks down on how we treat each other, he says, I could see how maybe he'd be an atheist. He says, but I cannot conceive how a man could look up into the heavens and say there is no God. There is so much evidence in the heavens that suggests that there's no way any of this happened by accident. We see different things when we're looking at the same thing. We come to different conclusions when we're looking at the same thing. Tonight, I want to get into a Bible story where a really spectacular event happened, a rare, well, absolutely unique event happened, and there were different people in groups witnessing it, and they all came to different conclusions, kind of like how Tim would try and you know, announce some good news about events that are coming up, and then Ty would always make a sourpuss comment about it. So let me just let me just read to you the story. When Jesus returned to Capernaum, after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And so many gathered around that there was no longer room for them. So a huge crowd has gathered around the home that he's staying at, and we think it's actually Peter's house, okay? Okay. Not even in the front door. He was speaking the word to them. So he was teaching this crowd. They didn't have nice comfortable chairs to sit in like all of us here. They were just crowding in around this house. That's the way they used to do it. You know, back in the days prior to the Revolutionary War, there was what we called traveling preachers. And they would travel around on horseback all throughout the American colonies, before this was even, America was even a nation. And their preaching changed the hearts of people and galvanized the people, and I think probably played the single biggest role in the fact that we won the Revolutionary War. George Whitfield was one of the guys' names. When you look at Whitfield, you'd never guess he was a great preacher. He's kind of cross-eyed, a little roly-poly, and yet... When he would preach, get this, when he was preaching once in Philadelphia on the steps of the state house there, they estimate over 50,000 people gathered in front of it and around and among in the streets to hear him. One of whom was a guy that you might have heard heard of, Benjamin Franklin. Whitfield and Franklin became friends. Franklin would support Whitfield's houses for orphans. And he appreciated the word that Whitfield brought. So people would gather around. And so this huge crowd is gathered around Peter's house. Then some people came. Some people, interesting, just real generic. Some people came bringing to Jesus a paralytikos. That's the Greek. Paralytikos. A paralytic. Couldn't walk. And couldn't use his legs. And he was carried by four of his friends. And when his friends saw that they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they sighed and said, well, too bad, so sad. Dropped him on the ground and walked away. No, it doesn't say that, does it? It says when they saw that there was a crowd, it says, this is interesting, They removed the roof of Peter's house. They climbed up on the top of Peter's house. And and, and the Greek is funny because it basically says they unroofed the roof. They didn't just make a hole. They took a big part of his roof off. Poor Peter, he's thinking, man, I got to go to Menards after this. Right? And after having dug through it, they let him down on a mat that the paralytic was laying on. This is their friend. I've known him, I'm sure, since childhood. And here's a really interesting little thing. Listen. 
when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. Jesus was moved emotionally by how much this paralytic's friends loved him. Do you have friends that you would unroof a roof for if it meant they could know Jesus? Hmm? Do you have friends that you'd run through a wall for? I bet you do, don't you? At least some of you. Jesus responds to the needs of this cripple because of the love of his friends. That would suggest to us, wouldn't it, that our love for other people can make a massive difference for them, even when they maybe don't have any faith or hope. Have you ever thought about that? Right now, I want you to take 30 seconds in, in the quiet right now. And I want you to think of one friend that you know needs God. And I want you to pray for them. I want you to unroof the roof for them in the holy place. Lord, in this quiet moment, hear our prayers. Before we say amen, I just want you to quietly, when I say now, speak their name aloud, just their first name. Father, hear the names of the ones that we love now. Amen. Jesus says, son, your sins are forgiven. How weird of a response is that? The friends are probably thinking, hey, wait a minute, rip off. We didn't bring him here to get his sins forgiven. We, we brought him here that maybe Jesus could heal him. But of course, in those days, if you were somebody who was stricken with paralysis from childhood, a lot of times what the people and the religious leaders did is they interpreted that as a curse from God that either you sinned or your parents sinned or somebody in your family sinned to cause your condition. It's your fault. And so the first thing Jesus does is he addresses the paralytic and says, your sins are forgiven. And by the way, not only did the paralytic need to hear that, Jesus, when he said that, was picking a fight. He was picking a fight. And I don't know if you know this about Jesus, but he's no Mr. Rogers, you guys. He picks fights all the time so that people might know God's real, true heart, a heart that the religious leaders in those days often did not reflect. He says, your sins are forgiven. Let me just pick it up here. And now some of the scribes and religious leaders were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this fellow speak in this way? It's blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Only God. Hmm? And at once Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were discussing these questions among themselves. And he looks at them and he says to them, why do you raise such questions in your hearts? He is God, isn't he? He knows what they're thinking. He knows what they're whispering. And he looks them in the eye and he challenges them. Why do you say such things in your hearts? And then he gives them a challenge. All right, which do you think is easier? To say to this paralytic, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, stand up, 
pick up your mat and walk. Well, anybody can say anything, right? Which is easier? It's easier to talk. It's always easier to talk, isn't it? But so that you may know that the Son of Man, and when he uses that title on himself, they knew exactly what he was doing. He was referring to himself as the Messiah, as God, the Son. That got their attention too. So you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So you know that. He looks at the paralytic child, it says. He doesn't just say, get up and walk. He looks and it says, technon, child. Jesus is always very personal and tender with people that are hurting. And he says, child, perhaps for the first time in your life, get up and use those legs. Get up and walk. Now, I want you to just take just a second to think about what it must have felt like in that moment. You have the crowd wondering what's going to happen. You have the friends hoping that his friend get healed. The paralytic does, probably doesn't hardly know what's going on because in the one moment his sins are forgiven and, and, the, and now the, the religious leaders and Jesus are fighting over him. And the religious leaders don't even seem to care about him and his, his condition. They just care about whether Jesus has the right to say the things he's saying. Is that the heart of God? No. You get an A tonight. It isn't. It isn't. And he stood up, and the paralytic immediately took the mat and went out before all of them so that they were all, says the crowd, were all amazed and glorified God. All except the religious leaders, who would later go out amongst themselves and plot how to kill Jesus. How can Different people see an event like that in such a different way. Other than it actually reveals what's in their hearts. Hmm? Well, I talk about it. Now that you've kind of heard me talk about it, let's make it stick. Let's watch it. Jesus of Nazareth! I saw what you did to the leper on the road this morning. My friend has been paralyzed since childhood. He has no hope but you. Please, do for him what you did for the leper. That's a rope! Put it back, man! If you are willing, Rabbi, I know you can do this. your tablet at least. Harry! 
he in danger? I don't know. No, I don't think so. He's got room in there? Yes. And you believe we're really here for this? Yes. Down. By whose authority do you teach? Answer me. If you are willing, Rabbi, you know you can't. Hey, I'm talking to you. By whom do you teach? Certainly not the authority of any rabbi from Nazareth. Where did you study? Your faith is beautiful. Son, take heart. Your sins are forgiven. Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Right. But I ask you, which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or rise up and walk? It's easy to say anything, no? But to show you, and so that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. I say to you, my son, rise. Pick up your bed. And go home. Hey, it's Dallas and the creator of the church. Can you imagine what it must have felt like to be that paralytic? To actually be able to stand up for the first time in his life. Walk. Not be dependent on other people. Can you imagine what it must have felt like to be his friends? Can you imagine what it must have felt like to be in the room and see something like that happen? That would be just as much a miracle today as it would have been then, right? in a world full of people who say they need to see and then they'll believe. Blessed are those who believe and a result, see. God's everywhere. 
Ask him to open your eyes. Because if you begin to see him where he is, that is how you'll be prepared for the return of this same Jesus when he makes everything new. And everybody will be healed. And everything. Let's pray. Father, open our eyes and help us to see your presence everywhere, to see the to see the evidence of your work in the beauty of the world around us and in the goodness when people choose what is right in a world full of bad. Fill us right now. Fill our hearts with your Holy Spirit that we might see because we believe. This is serious business. And in the next week, I pray that every person in this room might experience an unexpected moment where they see you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, the only unique Son of Man and Son of God, all God's people said, If you're new here, thank you for being here tonight. Um, before we worship, I, I just wanted to mention that if, if you're a regular attender or a member, we push you um, for that 10% offering. We believe that, that offering and giving is a part of our ministry here. And so if you feel so obliged during this, this Christmas season, this giving season, we do have offering boxes uh, out back um, through the doors there. And then as you enter either side of the building, just little black boxes, or you can give online um, on our website or text 84321. You can set up an automatic payment. Um, but we're gonna sing one more, maybe two more if you guys want. This is our final regular week. We have one more week next week. It's our Christmas finale, and then we won't see you again until January. So I invite you back up. Let's worship one last time.
You're more than welcome to go. We're going to sing one more. One, two, one, two, three. Oh, I searched the world, but it couldn't fail me. Sing now, you guys know if I know.
We'll see you next week.